This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host. Welcome, everyone. This is the Meaningful Sport Podcast, and I am your host, Nora Ronkainen. Meaningful Sport is a series of discussions on the why and how involvement in sport and physical activity can be an important part of a life worth living. If you are interested in the theme, you might also want to check out MeaningfulSport.com. There you can find podcast show notes, read a blog, and access many resources for further explorations of Meaningful Sport. Welcome back to the second part of our conversation with Rob Book, where we explore the stories of athletes who come from underserved communities. Rob is a PhD candidate at the Institute of Sports Science and Clinical Biomechanics at the University of Southern Denmark. His research project is titled Empowering Youth Athletes Against the Odds, Athletic Talent Development Environments in Underserved Communities. In the first part of our conversation, we explored Rob's own journey from a teacher and a coach in one of the most challenging school districts in the United States, to becoming a researcher and conducting research on athletes' developmental pathways who come from these communities. Rob also shared findings from his ongoing research, and we discussed the types of narratives he has identified in his data. Today, we will continue exploring the work Rob has done. We discuss these athletes' cultural transitions, the lessons learned from the research, and the practical implications arising from this exciting project. In the show notes, you will find links to the research we are discussing. I hope you enjoy today's episode. So, you mentioned earlier that elite sport is the context that you are now looking into, but but you are also, or your broader interest has been also this uh, participation, uh, more non-elite and recreational sport. So, yeah, what what are your directions for you in in your research in the future? What are, where would you like to go from what you've done now? Hmm. Yeah, I think that. Um... I guess I'm, I'm really, a couple of things I'm quite interested in. One, and I didn't really touch upon this, and I probably should have mentioned it a bit earlier when you'd asked sort of about some of these key, more key things that I've seen, you know, in my, yeah. in my research a little bit. And one of the big ones that I've, that I've seen um, is this, uh, this, cult, this big cultural transition that, uh, that, my, that I, the 10 athletes that I saw, I saw them make and, this is sort of verified by the by the uh, the stakeholders and my own experience was just how how moving from these different um, locations really really uh, proved to be just challenging cultural transitions. So so meaning that you know some of, in in all of these ten athletes I interviewed when they were in their underserved community growing up, they talked a lot about how when they eventually left their community and maybe went to a different high school or went to college where they were entering now, you know, a very affluent community, maybe, maybe it was now all white, you know, white college students. It was a huge cultural transition for them, a really, really Mm -hmm. big one. So once, but once they did that, what I then have seen was when, when those athletes, I think the seven of them who went and played basketball professionally in Europe, um, it almost was a little bit of a, a practice run for them, where they they were they got they were really good at becoming adaptable, and they were very good at uh, integrating into new experiences. Because they because as they described it to me was that was really hard was when they moved from sort of their underserved community in the U.S. to this more affluent one in the U.S. Then coming to Europe, it wasn't as challenging, um, I think, as. Uh, as maybe they thought it might have been. So I think I'm I'm very interested in this social theory piece of moving um, within different contexts and in different 
from different social levels. So I, I, I want to look at that a little bit, but, I'm, but I think my biggest thing I want to continue looking at is um, I want to sort of look at my idea, but move it out of this American context whereby it's, you know, there's a very big gap between the rich and the poor in the U.S. I think everybody, everybody's probably pretty aware of that. Um, but I'd like to bring it into a European context where I am now because, you know, say, for instance, in Denmark or Sweden or Finland. And when I talk to people here about, you know, colleagues about my research and they just they always want to preface their comment by saying, well, I know Denmark isn't like the U.S., meaning that, you uh -huh. know, there isn't the same level of poverty or, or social stratification. but what I believe to be true is that the feeling for a lot of people who are at the, on the lower socioeconomic level of a, of a, of a country, it's, it's very relative to where they are. So if some like Denmark has some very challenging communities, um, which the Danish government has decided to call, call them ghettos. And there's one in, in Odense right near where I live. And it's, mm -hmm. it has a lot of challenges. And I would contend that, a young athlete who's 14 years old, who's living in that community, they're probably feeling very similar to the athletes that I was coaching when I was working in the United States. They, they're not sitting here going, well, you know, my life's terrible, but at least it's not as bad as those guys living in the U S they, they know, they know that they have a tougher chance, tougher chance to making it to the top of sports in Denmark. They know that they're poorer than a lot of their people in Denmark who have, you know, uh, higher, more means. So I would like yeah. to, to look at that in a, in a Danish, in a bit of a Danish context, because when you look at, I've gone through, you know, I looked at all the national teams of, you know, the Dan Danish national handball team, football team, all these teams, you don't see a lot of minorities. Denmark is like 16% ethnic minorities, but you look at these pictures and a lot of them all look the same. They all, they all are sort of fitting into that, stereotype let's say so i think yeah. for when you're a small country like denmark with only six and a half million people and if you're not paying attention to just from an elite sport perspective you need to maximize your your uh, abilities to to develop athletes let's say and i actually looked at a i actually did some work with a with a club in this group this town called Volsmosa. they're called b1909 and they told me they had they had the exact same problems with their players as I had with mine. They said they, they the players are very engaged, and then when they become about fourteen, fifteen, or sixteen, they start leaving the club. They can't get them to stay because of the problems, the gangs, and the violence that's going on in these communities. So I think it's uh, a very relevant topic and a natural transition to move my research into this sort of broader, more international context. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask if. If you're aware of if we have like statistics, for example, from the Nordic countries, but yeah, you you said that you'd looked at the teams, and I mean that's my experience as well. That not having done any any research on that or looked at the numbers, but that seems to be the case that athletes typically come from a very particular uh, socioeconomic status and 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 social class. So yeah, that's certainly a very important thing also for these countries where supposedly everybody's equal mm. because we know that that's not that's not the case so if we think of some lessons learned from from your work and and you've looked at the pathways of these athletes who come from these underserved communities what would be some of the things that you would maybe lift up from that research what mm. we've learned compared to the uh, narratives that we typically have seen in, in the career pathway research so far and what could be done in the more practical applied mm. context to support these athletes. Yeah. What I, what I think is, you know, is really, is really, really crucial is to, to acknowledge that growing up in, in these underserved communities, which in, and I know using this term underserved is very vague, but I leave it intentionally vague because it's just sort of hard to to pinpoint all of the all of the factors that come along with it: poverty and um, low unemployment, parental education, and all these things. But yeah, um, within within a lot of these challenging communities, a lot of 
a lot of tra they're, they're they are traumatic, and there is data to support it. There's the the nineteen ninety six or ninety four the ACE study, the acquired childhood experiences, whereby when you're growing up, if you acquire a lot of these adverse childhood experiences, you're more inclined to trouble and, tra and trauma later on in life. And they're really showing that like growing up in these environments is in and of itself traumatic. And I think that what we need to do is, is coaches need to be aware. They need to be aware of where people come from. What, what does that, what does that mean? What does it, what do these athletes bring with them, positive and not so positive? So when I go back to, say, the, the Komatova article where she was talking to these, these coaches, and a lot of the coaches had some pretty negative stereotypes about these athletes. They're lazy. They smoke weed all the time. They don't work hard. They do this. And then I, yeah. I just think, well, wouldn't it, wouldn't it benefit these coaches to have a, a more positive understanding, to try to get to learn, to know where their athletes come from, to know what their background is like, to learn about the, all of the, the good and the, and the strength that comes from this? I think that that's, and I just think a lot of people just don't know, especially when they come to this European context. And then if I go back to then this, this American context, you know, there's, there's no organized coaching training program there like a lot of the coaches in these you know in my school i was a physical education teacher and i was an athlete so i had you know a good amount of training but some of the coaches were you know they might have been like a history teacher or a math teacher mm -hmm. who maybe maybe they didn't know anything about the sport and then you throw them in this in, into this environment and it's like you know maybe it would, maybe it would be nice to know well, well how can we support how can we support the athletes a little bit better what can we do to support you know them as people whole you know what what are, how can we just be better at what we do because i think if we're not paying attention to where people come from it's it's going to be problematic and, and you look at the the nba is spending a lot of money right now national basketball association looking and being very aware of mental some mental health issues that are coming um with a lot of these players bring and they sort of have a tendency to put it behind them. They try not to think about it, you know, sexual abuse, substance abuse, abandonment from parents and all sorts of things. But there comes a point where you can't push it away forever. And it, and it does come up and it creates a lot of problems for some of these very, uh, their athletes are now becoming a lot more outspoken about what it was like growing up and how, how it, how it affects them. And the biggest piece is, and I learned this from a very important uh, stakeholder in the NBA I interviewed. And he, had a lot of knowledge, and he um, and he said that, and I agree that the problem becomes that if you come from these challenging communities and you leave them, but you don't feel that you belong, sort of in this new kind of community, even if you're a professional athlete making a lot of money, eventually you're go you're going to continue to to do what is what you were used to doing when you were younger and you see it all the time you see all of these <laughs> professional athletes in the united states look at look at mike tyson for instance the famous boxer i mean yeah. he went through hundreds of millions of dollars because he never felt like he ever belonged anywhere than the streets of brooklyn and he kept going back there kept doing things that got him in trouble and you you know one of the athletes one of the athletes that i studied in my first paper he he was the most elite of all of them he had a very good nfl career in the national football league but because he yeah. didn't disconnect, he's the only athlete of the 10 that didn't separate just a little bit with his, uh, his rival, his, his community gang that he was affiliated with. And the NFL, before he got drafted, they found out about it. And it ended up costing him, over the course of his career, probably $50 million because they were scared to draft him because of that. So yeah. I guess it's sort of talking a bit about it's just really, really important. And of course, when you're coaching, you need to understand your players, all of them. But I think for this kind of an athlete, it's maybe even a little bit more important because they maybe don't have that support uh, in other areas that perhaps I would have had. It just sounds like such an overwhelming task to for a sports coach who is there to coach their team to be able to understand the athlete's background and somehow to help them to feel that they belong in the team 
even if they come from this completely different background and they have all these challenges at home and all all this baggage that they are bringing with them. And you also mentioned that you still wonder about this example that you gave in the beginning, whether you've made a right choice mm-hmm. as a coach and what you might have done differently. Yes. Yeah. It's a hard task, I think, but I think that, you know, I look at, I look at other, you know, and I, and I really do move it a lot into a European context because of, especially basketball, because of how many uh, basketball players end up coming, um, coming from the U S and end up playing in Europe. And um, just that I, I do think that, well, one, and another thing, it's a very transient, uh, it's a very transient profession you know these athletes are might be playing some of my athletes played on three different teams in a season they just keep jumping and jumping and jumping around and you would just and Mm -hmm. you just think that if if teams were able to to try to understand some of these athletes a little better and integrate them a little bit a little bit better um maybe they could build a team (laughs) from a from a different way than just having to get new players every every six months but of course you're right it's not everybody has the same contextual understanding of the situation that I do because, you know, I lived in it and I worked in it and, and I understand it, but you know, it's like, okay, does, does the Danish basketball league or the Finnish basketball league, would it be in their interest to, to consult with somebody who has some of this information um, to hold Mm -hmm. workshops with coaches and team managers and owners about things? Would, would it be beneficial to them? Yes. I, of course I think it would be. Um, But I don't know how, how high on the agenda they place this in their list of, of, of priorities. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that the cultural transition aspect of the story is what not, was not the initial interest of your research, but that's all something that mm-hmm. came up and what you are interested in working on in the future as well. So did you already identify some things in, in these athletes experiences, some, some things that the, uh, their teammates or their teams or that were doing well to help them adapt what would be this when they when they made the when they came over things. to europe yeah i think that um one i think there there remained there was a, a big network um of players they were quite connected with each other um from college and they would sort of talk and they had you know okay maybe talk to this agent or maybe do this um they were pretty. They were pretty good with that. I think a really a really big thing, like I said, was was their strength and ability to handle the unknown. Let's say. So mm-hmm. a good example I can give would be the one this one athlete, um, and so he was at the t- the very first. The title of my first paper was called "Oatmeal is Better Than No Meal," and it comes from this athlete. So he was the one who was abandoned in Detroit when he was younger. And long story short, he ends up playing professional basketball. He jumped around a little bit, um, got injured in South America. And then he was just sort of didn't know if his career was going to be done in basketball. And he, and he talked to a friend who was playing in Austria, old college teammate. And so this athlete just on a whim, he just sold his car and just moved. So he just took a chance. So he wasn't scared to take a risk and, and go over with no money because he's done that his whole life. He's had no money. So it's not that big a deal for him to take that chance. So he ended up over there, you know, got a contract, jumped around a bunch, ultimately ends up in a situation where he goes, he goes and plays and takes a contract for 100 euros a month to play in six division German league. So uh-huh. and he's like, he's like, he's like, I'm there playing with like, you know, people who are working at McDonald's and, you know, different jobs and they're just part-time players and you know he's destroying the league and he he goes where someone offers him a contract to the second division team so he breaks his other contract and then it turns out the second division contract doesn't doesn't come through so he ends up he's in germany with no money he has no money he talks to a friend of his who's living on an army base in germany military u.s army base so goes and lives in a military barracks for like like a month and like has no food, no money. And he's, he said there was a, a three day stretch where he was eating. Uh, he had a bag of potatoes and ketchup and he was making potato soup 
out of ketchup is what he was doing. And I think somewhere in the middle, I stopped him and I said, I said, no, I said, no offense. I was laughing. I said, that sounds really disgusting. <laughs> and he says, yeah. And he says to me, you know, he said, it was, it was disgusting. But he said, but he said, in my life, I've gone through so many periods of time where I had no meals and I didn't know where my next meal was coming. So anything was better than nothing. And then he said, oatmeal is better than no meal. You better be happy with that. And so it just showed me. So then eventually the story was great because then he ends up building his way up and now he's playing, you know, in the top Italian league. But I told him, I said, Ike, I said, like, first of all, I probably wouldn't have gone in the first place like you did. But I said, there's no way I would have stuck around like that. And he, and he did say, he said, my, you know, my whole life was a challenge. And I just kept focusing, working hard, hoping things would happen. I believed in myself. And, you know, he, he just had this ability to, to endure. That There's just no way that I would have had. And he completely accredits it to growing up in the environment than he did. But it's not to say that, that he advocates Oh, let's, everybody should have a really tough life so they can be resilient. In the end, of course not. No one, he, no one wants to have the life that he led. No one does. But yeah. he said, as a result, that was what you would call some kind of fringe, you know, fringe benefit, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Is that then a good example of this rags to riches narrative or sink or swim? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice feel good example. And, You know, every, yeah. you know, but it's it's it could have gone wrong in so many ways, but it didn't. And he had a lot of people that helped him, and um, yeah, he was just this. But yeah, for every everyone like him, you know, there are a lot of players who just couldn't just couldn't make it. And that's what I think about more than I think about the one the one that did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's been such a exciting discussion. I I learned a lot. We discussed some methodology, some qualitative research, and I think most importantly, you shared all these uh, very touching stories from your own life and also from your research participants' lives. So thank you for that. You're very welcome. If we, if we close up and nobody's going to remember all the stuff that we <laughs> have discussed, so maybe if you want to put one or two closing comments or remarks or what would be those things that if listeners can only remember one or two <laughs> things from our chat, what, what could it be? I think, I think that one thing I like to think about is I think just as a researcher, I think, I think empathy is just so important. And I think in life in general, being an empathetic person is so important and to try to really look at the world in a way where maybe you, you only you only can see the world the way that you see it and any any other perspective is you know it's different from your own and i think that in my research my ability to to really genuinely only believe that i know sort of what i know and anything anyone else's perspective is very different to, than mine and something that i can learn from has really helped me get some good insight into into my research, and I hope that that continues um, as I'm researching. I think in terms of, that's a, maybe a, a methodological little piece, but in terms of my actual research, um, I just think that it's so important for people and coaches to really try again i guess it t connects to this empathy to really try and understand where where somebody might come from and what their life might have been like before they got to you um it's just so easy to to get caught up and not think about that kind of stuff and i got and in my daily life as a teacher when i was in this environment it happened all the time it was you know, you're, you're trying to teach a class and a couple of the kids are just doing things you just never could imagine and you just get so frustrated. And then at the same time, you just forget, you know, like, this is a kid, they're 13 years old or they're 14 years old. And, you know, I remember one student of mine, I just talked to the other day as her life is going well. And, she, and I'm always reminded about her, about how she was, she told me when she was coming to school, she was living, her parents were dead. She was living with her uncle who was also pimping her out as a prostitute. And 
but then she still lived with him at that point and it was better because she he wasn't actually sleeping with her making her have sex with him and i think about this kind of stuff and it's so it's 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 just bizarre to think about what other people go through and i'm sort of going a little bit off a tangent here but i just think being empathetic Mm. to people and where they come from especially in in the kind of athletes that i'm researching are just is just so important because i think you can get so much out of them athletically if you can understand where they came from and appreciate and honor their story and their truth, uh, what their life was like. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important that you are doing this work and, and we also learn a lot by hearing these stories and just being aware that not everybody's life is like our own Mm. and, and how many different experiences there might be if you are working in a sport team. All mm-hmm. of them have a different story and a different background. How are you going to work with all of them and, and understand where they come from? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So best of luck with finishing the PhD work. Mm-hmm. When yeah. when are you due to submit uh, the that'll thesis? That'll be sometime, th- sometime next year, maybe around this time next year, hopefully. Okay, wonderful. So I I really look forward to reading the final work. And just like I said, I'll link uh, your articles to the show yeah, notes. Great. So so the listeners do go ahead and, and read the work so you will see all the details of what, what we discussed today. And yeah, thanks so much, Rob. I really enjoyed our Thank discussion. Thank you, Nora. I appreciate the chance to uh, talk today. It was really fun. Thanks for joining us this week on Physical Activity Research Through Podcast. If you like the show, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing or following the show on Twitter. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. If you found value in the show, we would really appreciate a rating on Apple Podcast or whichever app you're using. Or if you would, in a real old school way, simply tell a friend about the show. It would be a great help for us. We have a fantastic lineup of guests for forthcoming episodes, so be sure to tune in. Thank you all for your support and have a great day.